Good afternoon, and thank you for having me here. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the online experience for public library patrons and how we can make it better for your users. If you work in the library industry, you've probably heard this question before, usually from somebody outside the industry, and it goes along the lines of something like this. How are libraries doing? Are you worried about Amazon? What about eBooks? And the reason why you're getting some of those questions is sort of this perception that's out there. It's been verified by the Pew Research Foundation, it's been verified by OCLC, and that is this, that more than half of our library patrons uh, still have this overwhelming impression that libraries are just about books. So today we're going to talk about how we can enhance that reputation and include not just books, but all the other things that your library has to offer. So let's start with uh, taking a look at a typical library website and see where this impression might come from. I've chosen one here that I actually happen to like quite a bit. Uh, it's got some nice navigational aids. It's easy to see uh, uh, how to navigate through the site. And it's got that common white search box up in the top. Now, you and I know if you type a title or an author in there, you're probably going to get a hit and find something in the physical collection. But for the online user, the white box may mean something differently. And we don't need to necessarily recreate the wheel here, but there are some conventions out there that are used over and over again. And one of those is this. When you have a white box, it means you're searching everything in the catalog. But if you type something other than a title, author, or subject in this white box, guess what happens? You get an error message. And not only do you get an error message, sometimes you get encouragement to try that search again and double down on your frustration. But the point is that the search hasn't broken. The user is just unaware of what's actually available in that search. And it's no wonder because when they go to any other white box on any other retail site or web search site, what do they find? Let's look at a few. Take a look at Amazon. It doesn't matter what you type in there, it's going to search everything that they have. Whether that be a book, whether that be a DVD, groceries, electronics, anything that Amazon offers, they're going to be able to search it via that white box. And it's the same in any retail environment that you go to, whether that's Macy's. You want to search for raincoat, you want to search for shoes, same white box. And that's the issue that we have with some of our library sites today, is that if you're searching that white box, you're only getting the library catalog results. So let's take, it another take a look at another library site. This one I also like. It's got some uh, very easy to see navigational aids. And where are they putting some of that additional online content? Where are the things other than the catalog? You've got the catalog search right there in the middle. But they've got something under the research tab right there. Big problem right off the bat. Most people don't think they're actually doing research. In fact, many people. Uh, whether they're searching for car ratings or medical advice or anything else, they don't call that research. The other problem there is that, for the most part, users are not going uh, below the home page for any site, let alone library websites. So what that means is that typically they're using that white search box or they're bouncing off this page to go somewhere else. They may be going to their account page, but they very rarely go beneath those pages. If you look at your analytics for a typical library website, it's in the single digits uh, percentages for how many times they go down there. And so that, unfortunately, is where we're putting almost all of the library's full text online content under that research button. And what we want to talk about today is taking that, because when you arrive there, you get this nice little uh, uh, list of databases, and making that more available to patrons. The second problem here, once you've arrived at this page, is we still haven't gotten to a point where we can start searching. You can search for other subjects. You can figure out where you're trying to navigate. The patron may or may not recognize the database name. They probably don't. They don't know what Gale means. They don't know what EBSCO means. And if they're searching for something on cars, they don't necessarily know, is that in business? Is there a consumer database? Is there a ratings database? They don't really know where to search. So on top of clicking once, they probably have three or more clicks before they even get to the right location. So what we'd rather do is take this whole list of databases and turn it into something that's a little bit easier to use. One search box. If you want to call it Google for libraries, that's fine, but it's one search box for all of the full text content that you have. Not just your catalog, but all of those databases that you have as well. Because every library has access to content that's immense. In fact, uh, if you compare the size of a typical library catalog to all the full text content, use whatever analogy you like. A grain of sand to the beach, a drop of water to a bucket of water, whatever it is, your library catalog is actually a very small set of metadata. There's little full text in it. Uh, it may or may not have ebooks in it, but it definitely doesn't have the full text searchable in it. And so what we want to do is give you access and give your patrons access to all this other licensed content that you have that is immense. 
that is gigantic so that they can search all of the things that the library has and not just an inventory system of what the library physically has available. You have patrons out there that want this information. It may be information on their health topics. It may be information on their retirement. It may be information on their favorite baseball team. The point is, is that they're out there searching the open web. They may go to Google. They may go to Wikipedia. They may go to some blog site. So what we want to do is marry that demand out there for all of that information with the supply that your library already has. You have quite a bit of information in your library and we can use uh, EBSCO's discovery service to connect your patrons with that data. So what happens when a library implements discovery? What can you expect? What's the value that you can receive from it? Well right away we know a couple of things. First of all, for students, they're getting familiar with something that they're more than likely going to find when they get to a college or a university. So whether or not they're college bound uh, or whether or not they just need to finish a project, learning how to find good information, learning how to cite good information, learning the tools that do that and even some of the names of the journals uh, that they may want to go back to, this is helpful. When we did our own research to test whether or not students were successful at doing this kind of research, at writing these types of papers, what we found is that the ones that were successful actually were able to learn those skills as freshmen in high school. Whether or not they have access to this in schools, which is not always a guarantee, or whether or not your library has access to it and you can make it available to them, you're doing them a favor and guaranteeing their success once they get to college. And as I said before, uh, many colleges already have this discovery service. In fact, 6,000 of them have EBSCO's discovery service around the world. So this is something that uh, you'll be uh, preparing them well for. Now one of the more popular reasons and one of the more popular effects for implementing discovery is that your database usage will go up across the board. This is not just EBSCO data. This is all of your data content that's in our discovery service. So whether it's EBSCO, one of our competitors, an encyclopedia, Newsbank, NewJSTOR, whatever the source, you'll be able to go in and increase the database usage across the board. So this is probably one of the more exciting pieces of data that we have to offer for any library implementing uh, EBSCO's discovery service. Now maybe your service only doubles or triples, but you can see here if you were any of these libraries, uh, whether you're Richland County or Hennepin County, which are public libraries, or even Info Ohio, which is all the schools in the state of Ohio, you can see here they're not just getting incremental increases and they're not just getting search statistics. These are actually full text links. Uh, uh, folks have clicked on something to go read the full text and you can see 10 times the usage at least for each of these customers. And this is what's exciting and what's going to be exciting for your library. You have already invested money in these databases. An EBSCO discovery service is going to help them discover not only what databases you have, but it's going to create a better informed public for your society. This is what libraries have been doing for hundreds of years, providing access to materials and resources that individuals may or may not have access to on their own. They may not be able to afford them. I took this next slide from Morton Grove Public Library. And what's interesting here is that you can see sort of the differences for them between the open web and what their online databases can offer. And you could ask the same question of yourself and of your patrons. Is it important to you uh, where that information comes from? Who wrote it? Were they an expert in that field? Did they have an editor? Was it fact-checked? Is it real information, real research, or is it just the entertainment news that we get from the typical websites where we go for our news stories? These are the differences between open web sources and the sources that your library has. It is an unfulfilled demand out there. You can fill it. And when you start to fill it, it will become sticky. People will want to go back over and over to it. You'll create a better online experience, not just for your patrons, but for your library uh, uh, customers that have not been coming to the library to this point. So how do we do this? How do we make discovery work a little bit better? Well, I'm not going to go into a technical uh, conversation about this, and this Rube Goldberg machine is sort of a funny way to introduce this topic, but the point is this. When you're talking about discovery, we're introducing some things that your library has never been able to do before, and it revolves around two particular uh, uh, features. Number one is big data. We're taking massive amounts of full text and combining it in one place and indexing it. It doesn't matter if it's EBSCO data or some other database from some other competitor. We have all the data, metadata and full text in one place. It's all indexed together. When you have big data like that, you're able to have a, more than enough information so that you can go and get the most relevant information to make those results appear at the higher up in the list. Along with that, and just like the big web services, we also have aggregated search data. This is anonymous, but we're able to predict 
more than half the time what people are searching before they've even entered in a few letters. Most searches are one or two words. And as they type in the words, we're able to select the most popular searches for them and help them either spell out the rest of it or help them get to that uh, uh, target that much faster. So if you combine big data with the ability to uh, uh, look at aggregated search data, you can actually give them better results and give them an experience that they're used to seeing when they go to some of those open web services. And that hasn't been possible in the library world. They haven't been able to combine the data all in one place up until this point. So imagine taking your library catalog, your index databases, uh, you can take your ebooks, music files, uh, any type of digital content that you have, uh, and we can combine that all in EBSCO's discovery service for indexing and making available to your patrons. So the mechanics of how discovery works are pretty much done. They've been around for several years. We have the big data. We are looking at the aggregator search results to give better results. But you still have to have a good usable experience. It's one of the reasons people go to these open web sources over and over again. And we're not going to replace any of those. People will still be using Google tomorrow. They'll still be using uh, other sources tomorrow. But we can copy some of the better conventions that they use, in addition to big data and looking at the most popular search terms, and create an even better experience. How do we do that? Well, first, it needs to be easy to use. It has to look familiar. and has to look like something somebody has seen before. It also has to be fast. When we've compared Discovery to even some of the catalog searches that libraries are doing, our service is returning even faster results. And for certain generations of your library users, a slow result is tantamount to a service that they'll never use again. If you go over 10 seconds, they're never going to use it again. The results also have to be smart, and sometimes that means just not dumb. If you search on caffeine, you probably don't want results of some caffeine study somewhere on the other side of the planet for uh, animals in a zoo. You actually want some basic information on caffeine. And we have the ability, because we know what the most popular searches are, to give research starters or get it, to give that shallow dive for those users that type in simple searches and just want simple answers. And that's one way that we can be smart with our system. Of course, it needs to be easy to navigate and it needs to be easy to read. You need to be able to skim the results, to be able to see filters like you would see in an Amazon site or another retail site, and make sure that those are available uh, in your discovery service as well. A lot of times when people talk about EBSCO Discovery, they get it confused with a service that's been around for a while called Federated Search. EBSCO's had that product. Many of the ILS uh, services offer a Federated Search option, but it's nothing like Discovery. The only similarity they have is that they both have a search box, but that's where the similarity ends. If you consider usability studies, Federated Search fails on just about every category. It's not easy to use. It's not fast. It's not necessarily smart. It can be very difficult to navigate, and it's really hard to read the results. One of the problems that Federated Search has is that it's not able to give you guest access. Never mind the fact that it's hard to set up, never mind the fact that it's hard to maintain, it's not the same type of service. The advantages that you get with EBSCO's discovery service is that all the data is in one place. It's, it's aware of each other. There are subject indexes that make your likelihood of getting a more relevant, a more successful result possible. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to not change a perception so much, but to augment the perception that libraries are just about books. I still prefer to read a book as a book instead of an e-book. But the libraries are more than that. And when someone asks us, how are libraries doing? And are you worried about these things? We can actually point to an experience that shows them a whole lot more than libraries have been before. A library is more than its catalog. A library is more than its physical inventory. And there's quite a bit of information that we can get access to if we just make the online experience a little bit easier to use. Because one of the problems we have, especially in the younger generation, is that if this perception persists, you end up losing an audience that you might otherwise have. I pulled a quote out of here uh, from a teenager who said, I'm not a library person. I'm just not a book person. It had never occurred to her that the library had other things other than books. And this is not just an impression that teenagers have. There are others in your community that have the same point of view. So when we change that perception, we're going to help the kids that might be college-bound in your community get better prepared for it be better prepared to handle those tasks, to be more familiar with the services that are available there. Your public is going to be better informed. They'll have better resources available to them, not just the open web so resources. They'll be able to fulfill what libraries have always done in our country for a number of years, a number of centuries, and that is to provide access to information that they could not get otherwise on their own. They would not be able to have subscriptions to all these journals. They would not have it indexed together. They certainly wouldn't 
uh, necessarily be able to pull up the full text as quickly as they can and as successfully as they can with the library. And then if none of that's important to you, the fact of the matter is if you're investing anything on online databases, if you think online content is going to be valuable in the future, uh, it's valuable now, then it needs to be uh, more accessible. And that's what Discovery does. Your database usage will go up. And the final point I'll make is that libraries are more than just books. Libraries are about answers. And I borrowed a quote from Neil Gaiman, uh, which you see up here on the screen, which is, if Google can give you back 100,000 answers, a librarian can give you back the right one. Which is a great way of describing not only the library's purpose going forward, but also describing what Discovery can do for your library. The reason EBSCO Discovery is important for your library is very simple. You have this online content, massive amounts of online content. Unfortunately, many aren't aware of what's in that content. It's hard to access. Guest access is not available, and they may not be able to find what they're looking for quickly. It may not be, have the best usability. EBSCO's discovery service changes that. It makes that service available in a way that your patrons are familiar with. Instead of just having that white box search your catalog to just search titles and authors and subject headings, you can have that search box search everything in your library. And in fact, if they search everything in the library and it gives relevant results, it gives smart results, it gives fast results, your patrons are more likely to use it again. That database usage is going to go up. And that's, that's at the core of what EBSCO Discovery offers you. Your database usage will go up, it will be more valuable to your patrons, and your users will have a better online experience with your library. At the end of the day, we want to make new online customers for your library. We want patrons that have not been coming to your library before, that were only thinking that libraries were just about books, to discover all the different resources that your library has and come back and use them over and over again in a service that's easy to use and one that they enjoy using. Thank you for your time, and if you are interested in a free trial of EBSCO's Discovery, please let us know or follow the information on the screen.